ఇప్పుడు ఎందుకంటే చెప్తుంటే మీరు చూసిరు రాసుడు ఇప్పుడైనా మీరు చూసిరో చూడలేదు ఇక్కడైనా తాళపత్ర గ్రంథ రచయిత మీరు ఒకసారి ఆయన ఎట్లా రాస్తారో గంటంతో రాసడం మన పెన్నుతో రాసేది ఏమిటి అడ్డం రాస్తాం దీన్ని రాసేది ఏమి వెరైటీగా ఉంటుంది కింది నుంచి కొడుకు రాయాలి మీరు ఎవరైనా కావాలంటే దాన్ని మేమంటే చూడండి ఇక్కడ వచ్చి రాసుకుంటాడు
Yeah, so this is going to be the last session before uh, the evening uh, performance uh, for this two days uh, eventful uh, conference. And it is such a pleasure and it's a great education uh, these two days. Uh, and I thank uh, Judith and Nicole. In fact, I think they started this journey with what is what was earlier called uh, uh, research network on Dalit literatures. Now, Dalit literatures and Adivasi literature and performance and archives, uh, arts. I think they have taken a bigger kind of a, a role. And uh, so we have been traveling uh, with them for this uh, uh, four or five years. And it has been such a great uh, journey. And also I'm uh, uh, kind of very thankful to the, uh, uh, the other organizers of this event. Uh, and particularly uh, Professor Jaydir uh, Thirumal Ragaru because the, the kind of depth and uh, the, the complexity that he brought into the discussion through the Adivasi uh, uh, Art Artifacts Exhibition and also the, uh, the art forms, the performances. In fact, generally literary scholars, we, we are happy with the text. We don't give, go beyond the text. So in fact, I think he pushed this entire network into the oral and to the performative <coughs> and other kinds of uh, traditions. And in fact, what we have uh, in front of us as uh, uh, earlier someone was saying that that it's not uh, simply sex, it's not marriage, it is something else. So what is implied in that is that the kind of material that is in front of us now in the form of Puranas, in the form of these narratives, in the form, form of uh, uh, these drums, in the form of these little magazines. So this is a rich archive. To this archive, we don't have the language. We have, don't have the uh, categories. We don't have the perspectives to analyze these actually. This is a kind of rich archive. Uh, this is a kind of a domain of culture that we have not actually paid attention to. So what I think this network has brought into the public and visibility is, is a kind of complex situation. Of course, we, we try to interpret it as, okay, so this is the other sexy, uh, the sexy's interest in sex and so on, but there may be other ways thinking about it. So that way I think we really have to go along with these kind of uh, narratives, Puranas, and also how to learn uh, uh, how to kind of uh, resolve with these complexities. In these two days, I think uh, the, the first panel was a, a panel on Gond culture. And in fact, in this panel, you have another uh, presentation on uh, Hammondorf's photographs of the Gonds during the Nizam time in the 40s. Uh, Suresh, a scholar from EFL, EFLU, uh, is, is kind of doing that. And then the Bindla performances, uh, the, the, the uh, presentations on drumming, uh, Samala was referring to the skin and it's speaking uh, to the present uh, situation and poetry, films and the excellent uh, uh, exhibition on Dalit periodicals and, and the range of uh, you know uh, issues involved around that. And, and I think I really like today the morning when they are really presenting uh, a certain kind of context and also giving the depth and scope of that, uh, that field uh, for research. And of course, the, the other uh, interesting presentations on uh, the indigenous uh, uh, storytelling, uh, both whether it is from Assam, whether it is from uh, 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 Telugu, and, uh, and of course, the uh, Dalit Puranas. So uh, from this panel, I think I'm taking you from away from uh, Telangana and to Assam to Kerala and Tamil Nadu a little bit. And of course, you still are in Telangana with the photographs, but still I want to take you to the other uh, regions. So we have three uh, presentations shortly, I think 10 to 12 minutes they'll take. After that, we'll have some discussion. And I'll start with uh, uh, Parvati. Yeah, Suresh uh, is a student of our uh, department. In fact, Suresh uh, worked on uh, uh, a very important uh, colonial anthropologist called Hammond Dorf, who worked with uh, Nizam's government. And in these Telangana circles and Andhra circles, Hammond Dorf is highly respected uh, figure as a scholar who worked with the tribals and Adivasis, particularly Gonds and so on. He's written extensively. So I think Suresh uh, examined his writings in the thesis, but also uh, as he was doing it, he also collected a number of photographs that uh, uh, Hammond Dorf uh, uh, kind of curated at some point of time. So he's going to look at some photographs and uh, make his observation. Uh, I, think to, I think the brief introduction for Suresh, I think he gave only three lines. Uh, the research scholar at if base if, at Iflu, he has successfully completed a thesis titled Colonial, Colonial Anthropology and Contemporary Debates over the Question of Tribal Identity and Development, Understanding Hemandar's Legacy in Telangana. Areas of interest include tribal studies, colonial anthropology, and Indian cinema. has also published a paper titled uh, Hemandar and the Tribes of Telangana. And Suresh, now. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, 
so so this uh, this paper uh, this presentation is titled representation of uh, gonds in colonial photography and i'm still i'm i'm i won't say i'm fully aware i mean i'm fully com I'm completely prepared but i'm still trying to understand so um so i mean it's it's still open i'm i'm, I'm still preparing but uh, so i'll i'll come to that but uh, this uh, this photograph is not very clear but uh, you can see it's a tribal woman and uh, if uh, some of you are familiar with the uh, works of heimendorf you would uh, know that this is the cover photo of his book called uh, uh, tribes of india a struggle for survival so this is the cover photo of uh, the this book so now now looking at you know i mean so if whatever knowledge we have about tribes today is it's a, oh, after a lot of debate and lot of reading over the over a long period that you know we have come to understand tribes and we don't see the see tribes as say this photo was taken in 1940 and we don't see the tribes as you know we can see here in this photograph and so we our knowledge of tribes has changed but i am focusing on these photos and these photos were taken in the in 1940s so in 1940s so how did uh, an anthropologist called hamandorf how did he arrive at these photographs so i am so i am basically going back to that history so the whole concept of tribe and the anthropologist's preoccupation with, with tribes and photographs so i will just look at that history i mean it's open for all of us to see these photographs today and make our own observations but i am mainly focusing on the history and the history of how did this you know this photo come <laughs> at that time in 1940 so so i'll just give uh, i'll just briefly talk about you know this concept of tribes so and then i'll come to how anthropologists you know uh and you know why anthropologists became so preoccupied i mean not why the anthropologists became so preoccupied but how they studied and you know what is the importance of this photograph in a, these photographs in a way so talking about tribes we have to go back to 1857 in a way because that's a seminal event in the you know history of india and after 1857 this is uh, i am borrowing from you know major scholars who have worked on you know colonial india so we see that after 1857 there is this the colonial government was shook ki what's happened what's what just happened so they you know they they try to understand the native society better and you see that that's when after two decades of after two decades of the mutiny you see that there's a there's an attempt to make uh, the census of the population of india so you see that there are uh, then they they go back to the existing hierarchy of caste so and then that is when the caste and tribe these two concepts also are reinforced right so with the census making these this uh, the concepts of tribe and caste become re they are reinforced and and we see that through uh, uh administrators uh, so administrators in the colonial government they started doing ethnography of so they start uh, producing works on castes and tribes of india so the first one was about the castes and tribes of west Be uh, bengal and after that there was another seminal event in the tribal history is the 1874 and 1871 criminal tribes act and 1874 uh, the scheduled district act so these are two important events in tribal history and it's after this that you know 1874 uh, scheduled district act we see that there is uh, a creation of a separate district separate agency for tribal people and then that gets that gets carried forward and in 1919 <laughs> uh, government of uh, india act and also again 1935 government of india act this th this concept was solidified and by you know 1950 we saw we see that you know the sixth and uh, sixth schedule and fifth schedule areas get uh, you know a become a reality and it's carried forward in independent india so the 
from the administrative point of view, we see that these uh, these laws and enactments by the go you know colonial government they sort of made okay these these where you know in these areas the tribes are in these areas and they need to be protected. So that is from the uh, the colonial government's point of view. And you now I'll talk about anthropologists. So earlier anthropologists from so there were anthropologists, but they were mainly administrators then they they, they they were really interested in you know enumeration they, they really they wanted to work on you know castes and tribes of india so they produced a lot of work but they were mainly administrators but later came the anthropologists like heimendorf or verrier elvin but verrier elvin was a missionary but then he lived with tribes and then produced a lot of work whereas heimendorf Unlike other anthropologists, other administrate, administrator turned anthropologists, Hammondorf is a trained anthropologist. He did his PhD in anthropology and then he comes to India. Well, his interest was mostly in Northeast India, but he was forced to come to Telangana, the uh, Dizams, Hyderabad. So then we see that these are the photos. So now Hammondorf, in his autobiography, he writes, so his journey as an anthropologist began uh, when he was in his college and he would uh, get to know about uh, other uh, anthropologists. Uh, so this anthropology as an area was is still in the uh, in, a, in its beginning stage. So he was mostly inspired by uh, stories of uh, anthropo I mean not stories I would not say stories but you know writings of anthropologists who were not not just in India but other places like Indonesia, uh, New Guinea, and other you know what we you know say East. So he was inspired by that, and then in his autobiography he says he wants to study a tribe that is untouched by any other anthropologist. So he wants to study a tribe that's untouched by any other anthropologist. So you can see that through administrative point of view and from the anthropologist's point of view, they are looking at <coughs> communities that were untouched. And, you know, they are backward. Well, the idea was almost established by then, that 19, it's in 1940, but by then the idea was established that, you know, tribes are backward, tribes are isolated, they have a distinct religion, they have a distinct culture, and, you know, very, uh, I mean, uh, backward looking and I mean, um, I don't know if I should say, but yeah, anyway, I'll not. Um, very ancient looking in a way. So that's one of the ideas that anthropology at that point of time had. But anyway, uh, Hammondorf's ideas did change later on, but uh, you can see that anthropology, anthropologists and colonial government had this concept of tribes and and that's how we arrive at this photograph. So what we see from today's point of view is a different thing. But in 1940, when this photo was taken, you can see that. And also from what I said, what Heimendorf was looking at, he's, in, he's actually looking at a tribe that's untouched. So he wants to study a community that's untouched. He wants to be the first person to study this one, a tribe. So you can see that the idea of tribe is, is like that and and that's when this photograph comes so all so he has taken 15000 photographs and it's it's a okay uh, I'll, I'll come to those photographs but i'll just give this background in the sense so when uh, when these photographs were taken so that is the idea of tribes and that's how you know we can we can see them and we can uh, interpret them in you know in our own way but i am just giving you the history of how this you know photograph arrived so um so this is a you know typical uh, i mean a represent i mean a, gold, a normal a gold woman and this is a, a you know a typical gold man and then uh, this is a, a school that was established uh, with the help of uh, nizam's government by Hammondorf, and you can see that the children are uh, you know you know studying in uh, in this in this school and then uh, okay uh, i don't think you can see this picture very well but uh, yeah i don't think you can make out anything here yeah these are girls studying here and uh, so 
and then this is the village gathering and then uh, uh, it's a it's a a kolam priest uh, hamandorf has taken a photo of uh, a kolam priest a kolam is a uh, you know uh, we can say subsection of uh, gond clan um, and then uh, this is a, a funeral procession okay sir yeah so anyway uh, this is uh, a village a village scene uh, it's it's a, any on a normal day you see this is the this is how the village looks and then these are uh, lombardi women uh, you see this is the okay, yeah so okay next one this is a bhil man uh, it's not from telangana but a bhil man uh, somewhere else taken somewhere else in india uh, this is uh, i don't know if you can see this this is a chenchu man and chenchu hamandorf says that a chenchu is a tribe that was that's very primitive unlike i mean much primitive than other tribes in uh, telangana uh, this is a, a thakur woman uh, this is a upper caste thakur woman so uh, you, you can see i don't know you can you can't see it clearly but this she is wearing a lot of jewelry so i also want to uh, draw your attention to the kind of photographs i mean his his view of uh, people of india so upper caste women wearing a uh, wearing jewelry i don't know if she is wearing jewelry every day but uh, here she is and another upper caste uh, thakur man uh, that's another okay so yeah so this these are a few photographs i don't have i mean we don't have a lot of time but uh, hamandorf's photographs are available on soas website and there are 15000 photographs and not all of them are from you know of tribes of telangana uh, andhra pradesh but also i mean lot of them of uh, of uh, photographs of tribes of uh, northeast india as uh, arunachal pradesh and nagaland he was uh, there in nagaland and arunachal pradesh for a long time and uh, he's taken photographs of tribes and other people from all over india okay so so what i'm drawing your attention to is uh, that from what we i mean if we look at these photographs uh, we might have different opinions different perspectives but these photographs were taken in 1940 and uh, and the arrival the happening of these photographs is the history of it is an important thing for me and i think whatever i've summarized uh, through in this presentation that you know that it's the colonial government and the anthropologists interests are all there and then this is how this photographs comes into existence is what i will argue and thank you so um good afternoon everyone and uh, thank you sir for your introduction um yes i think i am audible right um so um the title of my paper today is Uh, from bondage to liberation unveiling the transformative power of gaddiga in adiya culture so gaddiga uh, is traditionally a ritualistic practice of one particular adivasi community called the adiyas so the adiyas um, they inhabit this um, hilly district of northeast kerala which is called vayanad and um, this vayanad uh, the Vayanad was part of this Malabar district uh, uh, of the erstwhile Madras presidency during the colonial regime uh, in Kerala. Uh, so this colonial regime um, is from 1800s to the 1940s. So that background is really important to understand the culture and history of the Adiyas. So uh, how do the Adiyas um, see themselves? The Adiyas um, uh, see themselves as um, food gatherers as well as independent cultivators traditionally and historically. Uh, but then uh, this is the identity that uh, they talk about um, through their uh, rituals as well as folk performances. um and through their traditional hymns but then what is the problem here the problem here is that during the colonial times uh, the adiyas got uh, represented as slaves they got represented as thieves and criminals and um obviously they have a history of uh, slavery um in the paddy fields of vayanad but then um, that is very specifically during the colonial times 
um but then uh, the problem here is that uh, if you go and look into the colonial archives the picture the prominent <coughs> picture that you get about the ideas is that uh, they are represented as slaves and this multiplicity of their identities that is ideas as food gatherers and ideas as shifting cultivators all of these identities are um sort of pushed under the carpet and if you think about an idea you immediately think that oh he or she is a slave so it's like that so um uh, how does one deal with this how does one deal with this um identity crisis identity problem so the ideas um resort to their um ritualistic realms to um uh, to engage with this problem uh so that is what uh, i will be talking here uh, in this session uh, so gaddiga gaddiga uh, is their ritualistic uh, performance um and um usually it's overlooked by a shaman shaman like a priest a chief priest from the community so he supervises it and uh, what is uh, gadiga it is actually a mythical narration a narration of their mythical history so that is uh, this ritualistic practice called gadiga and here uh, i am not interested in gadiga as um, ritualistic practice so my interest here is that how do the ideas kind of historicize their myths how do they try to uh, recreate history recreate the history of uh, for instance slavery the colonial history of slavery through this ritualistic practice uh, so that is one important thing that we have to look into so uh, to give you an introduction on what gadiga is uh, so Uh, i have said that it's a ritualistic practice and when is it performed it is performed when uh, one community member is suffering from some sort of an illness like suppose one community member is sick then uh, the people over there think that some misfortune might have affected them so let's just uh, call the chief priest and then perform gaddiga um and their belief is that uh, by performing gaddika they will actually ask for the blessings from their uh, deities various deities and one important deity is mariamma we have been um, listening to this yellamma story a lot like in the uh, yesterday and also in today's session so here the uh, protagonist is mariamma goddess mariamma so she is the chief deity of the adia community and um, when you in when the community members obviously when the shaman invokes her she'll um, she'll uh, she'll be present at that um, at that place and she'll speak through this shaman through this shaman's mouth and then um, the shaman will actually tell the community members the reason for the illness which might have affected a community member and then you have remedies he will also tell the remedies and this portion is there this part of gaddiga is there but then in the present times um the adia community's members especially certain cultural icons from the community uh, for instance there are people like pk kalan and then there is another person called pk karian so or uh, these two these two um uh, adia chieftains they are shamans from the community and they are also chieftains um they were also really involved in this um uh, cpi um led uh, movements in vinard during the 1950s and 60s so they are both political figures and they are also cultural icons from the community so what do they do um these two persons they have actually revolutionized this ritualistic practice called gadiga and they have brought it to the popular stages in kerala for instance it's it's a ritual but then now what do you do you actually take it to the uh, secular secular stages of kerala and you present it as uh, a popular culture and thereby gadiga becomes the uh, the uh, you know the cultural capital of the adia community and how does that happen uh, in order to understand that we have to uh, we have to i have to talk a bit about the myths that are being narrated through this uh, ritualistic practice called gaddiga so i said that through the performance of gaddiga the adia community members are trying to historicize their myths so um how does that happen there are um various characters coming in through this myth like i said there is goddess mariamma then there are other deities called uh, malakari there is siddappan there is jogiachana all kinds of deities um 
they are um, they they have uh, clearly they have very much close resemblance to a normal a common adiya man so uh, what is the role of this goddess maria mother uh, her role is that immediately before the harvest season happens for instance in the months of june to july she'll come over to uh, over to vayanad obviously the adiyas inhabit vayanad so this goddess mariamma will make a visit to uh, vayanad and then uh, she will take away all the disease uh, causing seeds uh, which uh, might have affected that locality she'll take those uh, diseases from this place and she'll carry it to the neighboring um, neighboring state which is karnataka so she visits vayanad she travels back to karnataka so she has an itinerary in nature that's my point she um, irrespective of borders she'll come from karnataka to vayanad then vayanad to karnataka like that and also there is this belief that um, there are various other deities who who when they visit the paddy fields of vayanad this landlords as well as this laborer so you must not forget this aspect the shaman who is actually performing gaddiga he earlier he was a valley laborer he was a slave of the landlords so that is that is there um, so and um, when goddess mariamma comes the landlord as well as the valley laborer will Uh, pay their oblations to this uh, very powerful deity so in that in that sense um, you know there is a subversion of power uh, happening the landlord himself will pay um, pay respect to this um, adiya deity and then uh, certain other deities like uh, jogi achan for instance um, he um, he is described as a person who is living in a thatched hut near a paddy field so he is um, undoubtedly um, a man who is a, a deity who is engaged in agriculture so what are his belongings he only belong a pestle a mortar some cooking utensils like that so he's just a common man and he also wears copper bangles and all so very specific uh, resemblances to this adiya culture and life then uh, we have references to certain deities like malakari which is uh, this person is actually the king of the hills and the plains so um the adiyas are trying to say that uh, once uh, so um, what is this once once is this pre colonial times when they were not dispossessed uh, when their lands were not alienated um, when they were able to really sort of move freely over the hills and plains their mobility was not controlled by any kinds of colonial um, uh, legalities like the maybe the conservation of forest policy or they were not um, restricted by the um, uh, the uh, sort of land revenue implementation so they were really free in a pre colonial time so uh, what they are trying to say through this gaddiga is that uh, they have a history to slavery so uh, if you look at the colonial archives they are just slaves but then adias have a history to tell history to talk about their roots of bondage so that is how they try to recreate history that's how they historicize their myths and when this gaddiga performance comes to the popular stage uh what happens is that so for instance i uh, have been doing field work uh yes sir i'll conclude uh field work uh, since uh, 2018 so 2018 to 2021 so uh, i have visited the the adia hamlets as well as i have been a regular visitor of this uh, tribal festival which was organized by the um kerala state government uh, so it's it's that's also called gaddika but then gaddika tribal festival so you have popular uh, so secular performances of gaddika happening on the uh, public stages so um what i want to say is that uh, through the uh, the secularization of this gaddiga performance the ideas are making a strong statement that uh, the non adivasi community uh, are equally part of their history of slavery they are equally uh, um, they can't shy themselves away from the fact that no we are landlords you are just slaves and our history is different not like that we have a very connected history and through remembrance of slavery uh, they are not just lamenting their past but uh, they are all also actively trying to engage with certain forces of colonial modernity and it's also an orientation for them towards future on what strategies that they have to take so this art uh, very much becomes revolutionary for the 
for uh, for a subaltern community and then myth becomes history and history becomes myth so it's very much important and then um, i have uh, two videos to show i'll just um, show you a short video of gadiga performance which i um, have from the tribal festival in kerala yes so um, in the beginning uh, there is this i have said that there is a shaman and he will explain to the audience about the importance of gadiga and their place uh, as agriculturalists so they are dressed in saris they are dressed as goddess mariamma okay so here you can see mr pk karian uh, he is uh, he um, was the chief priest of the community um, he passed away recently so he is explaining to the audience uh, the importance of performing gadiga festival immediately before the uh, before the performance and then um, he is accompanied by vocalists and this uh, hymns will be uh, will be played to the beats of two musical instruments one is tudi which is a uh, which is a percussion instrument and other is called kural which is actually a, a, a piped instrument like a flute yes so um, that is there and then uh, let me uh, quickly show you the dance performance so this is uh, how it happens okay uh, here you saw the performers in saris uh, performing to the beats of uh, the musical instruments and they are dressed up as goddess mariamma so i'll stop there okay, thank you so much yeah thank you parvati and uh, so next time judith will bring the performance <laughs> if there is a chance sure. <laughs> yes is it possible yeah and next presentation by parsadi and i think we have uh, lost some time uh, parsadi is a uh, assistant professor from uh, the, from the department of cultural studies eflu uh, and i think without wasting the time maybe parsadi please you are okay. well known yeah he has got a long <laughs> can you open that uh, uh, suresh there is a folder i wanted to keep a picture a painting which is uh, Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some of my views. Uh, in general, uh, also thinking along with the conference, uh, how do we make sense of uh, the cultural objects, uh, the whole lot of cultural uh, products coming from the subaltern communities, and in what way they are connected to the larger political struggles to engage with the problem of caste so so let me begin with this idea i have kind of named this uh, paper uh, somewhat connecting the idea of annihilation of caste and art so annihilation is one of the few, very few words that gradually lost its place for the past three decades probably on a parallel with the rise of the word identity Uh, in the critical discussion on caste there is certain historical association that word has 
with the history of uh, violent uh, revolutions of course the one which uh, particularly the french revolution that is uh, remains one of terror uh, the french revolution is also uh, vividly uh, present in ambedkar's imagination uh, it invokes terror it's none other than uh, uh, robespierre the man often invoked in the discussions on terror uh, he says that we must annihilate the enemies of the republic at home and abroad or else we shall perish uh, so the, the state should uh, the terror is nothing but justice swift severe and inflexible this is robespierre the terms the term annihilation is resignified in many ways within india for instance the naxal bari movement signified the term quite literally more or less in a similar way to what maximilian robespierre did interestingly uh, a distinct twist to the term is assigned by ambedkar in his annihilation of caste this is possible for ambedkar when he realized uh, that the enemy what one thinks of as a enemy caste uh here caste is not a readily visible out there kind of a phenomenon that you can actually catch caste and annihilate is not something that you can do it right uh so this is happening in a colonial context ambedkar kind of thinks about what are the ways of thinking about annihilation of caste uh despite the overwhelming rise of questions about national freedom uh based on the goals of self rule swarajya uh you know uh, all kind of uh, nationalist uh, movements and projects during the late colonial period the question of equality that insisted on the substantial social freedom could make certain impacts in the public consciousness in a correspondence with santram of jatbat todak mandal ambedkar suggested that the real way to break down caste system is neither by promoting inter caste dining nor by inter caste marriages ambedkar pointed to the hegemony of shastras that organized the organized and sustained the existence of caste through practices in his annihilation of caste he went on to say the reformist efforts to organize inter dining and inter caste marriages are acts of enforcement and point to and also points to create conditions by which one transforms the ideological operation of shastras and vedas uh, that are actually subjecting the hindus to practice caste while approaching the mandal jatbat jodak mandal uh, for figuring out the problem within hindu society uh, while appreciating this uh, kind of activities of the mandal quite clearly ambedkar differed from the belief that inter caste marriages will transform caste i quote a, a kind of couple of lines from ambedkar caste is not a physical object uh, like a wall of bricks or line of barbed wire which prevents the hindus from co mingling with the other ones right so therefore you can pull down the caste in a uh, in a in a as if it is a kind of object so he goes on to theorize caste as a invisible ideological force which are actually uh, working with uh, shastras uh, more interestingly part of ambedkar's argument is that he located the site of contestation on the ideological discursive register by suggesting that caste is not a tangible object but constituted by uh, meanings and beliefs mediated by ideological function of the shastras needless to say ambedkar is not denying the materiality of caste as it works in the real conditions and the point here is about the discursive sites themselves are material indeed where caste is produced reproduced need to be contested and the new conditions to be created to make the hegemony of shastras lose their grip over populations significantly Uh, the move with a uh, pinch of polemics is also against certain kind of positivist understanding uh, caste as a verifiable scientific object social scientists would be very disappointed 
Ambedkar's project of annihilation of caste does not imagine a utopia of non-ideological regime. Rather, he was sure that one set of beliefs uh, and practices need to be replaced with another set of beliefs and practices. If one has to push Ambedkar to the extreme, annihilation of caste can be configured partly as a set of signifying practices that pose challenge to the whole field of culture where the knowledge and the power intersect. Most certainly, uh, a contestation within the material fabrics of language and culture, the site where meanings are not settled for once forever, but the possibilities are open for resignification, so to invoke uh, Stuart Hall. If caste annihilation involves a whole lot of discursive activity of signification and resignification, what can the artists do to annihilate caste? What will the painters do? What will the literary uh, writers do? Not surprisingly, the last great uh, movement of that kind insisted on the annihilation of caste. Uh, the Dalit Panthers of Maharashtra uh, has its members almost necessarily everybody is an artist in, in many ways, either poet or a, a creative writer or a painter. So there is a coming together of uh, the political interest and the aesthetic uh, activism. Having said that, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, a few paintings uh, from a collection of uh, paintings from Dalit artists. Uh, this is uh, what happened in the 1990s and uh, 2000s, early 2000s in Tamil Nadu, particularly in the 90s uh, up to 95, uh, from 92 onwards, there was a large scale violence and conflicts and clash uh, uh, among the, uh, between uh, backward caste groups and uh, uh, Dalits in the southern parts of Tamil Nadu. There is a lot of attack on Dalits villages, households, uh, people are killed. There is a lot of violence and arson, right? So there is a, there is an effort by some of the Dalit intellectuals to actually uh, respond to this conduct through paintings. So they organized a workshop in 1997 uh, and brought a volume of paintings. Subsequently, in 2004, again, another set of paintings which are brought back. Uh, to kind of respond to the violence, right? So we have few paint, uh, paintings. I uh, will have a look at one by one and uh, uh, see what actually, how do we make sense of them uh, in a context and in what are the ways in which uh, they are actually uh, able to engage with the problem of caste and what are the conditions that actually uh, produce uh, the possibility for the arrival of such uh, paintings, right? So it's not simply about uh, there is a context of caste violence and then people produce the painting. It is also the fact that these produced paintings, they have their own lives. So they signify, they kind of uh, intervene in our ideas. They make sense in a particular way. They work in a very different way, right? So for example, this is the one by, uh, can you just come down to see the name of the painter on the top? On the top, there is a name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is uh, Sivakumar, uh, V. Sivakumar's. Uh, this is actually a, an interesting painting. If you look at it, on top of uh, your head, on above your head, uh, you can see that image of uh, image of uh, something like a temple uh, bell kind of uh, uh, images, and they are larger than life, right? Now they are like. They, they seem to uh, give an impression that uh, it's not uh, simply the faith, but almost like terrorizing the people. You just imagine all those bells ringing uh, and kind of producing certain forms of soundscapes that it's like a tyranny or a, a, it's a kind of uh, something overwhelmingly, uh, it's not simply you are uh, 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 devoting to something, but you are also under the fear, right? So it's a kind of representation of uh, the kind of uh, uh, sastras and uh, religious uh, beliefs overwhelmingly taking over people's lives above their head, right? That's how I see this uh, painting. 
uh, we can move to the the first one. This is the first one. Uh, here is a painting by Abraham. Uh, yeah, yeah, name also can be seen. I would put maybe full screen, window full screen. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a uh, word file. Word it's word fine, word. yeah. I, I, I can tell the name. This is Abraham. Uh, so what is happening in this painting is uh, there is certain form of uh, realism that it's clearly identifiable uh, objects. You can see there is a, a bench. Uh, uh, this bench actually invokes the image of a bench in a tea shop. That's the thing, right? Then you see two Yishantro cups on the bottom and then you see there is a coconut shell, right? So the, what is interesting about this painting is that it kind of uh, brings the, uh, it brings both spatial and the temporal aspects of the practice of untouchability. In a sense, uh, the coconut shell is supposed to be the, uh, the earlier form of uh, practices of a uh, kind of cup to drink uh, tea in a tea shop, which is given to the untouchables. But then in the modernized world, uh, in a modernized world, uh, there are this uh, system of isanthro cups that you know you don't need to uh, give dalits in a you know a steel tumbler which everybody uses. You can just uh, give a isanthro cup and get it right. So in a way, it, it kind of uh, both. Uh, it, it, that's a kind of temporal dimension of the painting. If you want to think about it spatially, it is also brings together uh, the practices of uh, untouchability in different kind of spaces. While the uh, rural contexts where still there is a possibility of uh, the coconut shell being given uh, for the tea, uh, in the urban uh, metropolitan contexts, uh, it is the Yushantro uh, plastic cups. So in, in the painting that actually brings that to the center, to, center of the uh, table. That's the painting by Abraham. Uh, now we can move to the next one. Uh, uh, yeah. Two more paintings, yeah. Come down, yeah. Yeah, here is the one. Uh, this is by uh, Pa Ranjit. He was a painter uh, of the time, was part of the workshop. So this is a painting that, uh, so it's an interesting painting in a sense. Uh, there is a lot of uh, ways in which you can actually uh, paint cast oppression, right? So you may find uh, people writing about, uh, people drawing also all, kind of pictures about poverty, poor people, etc. So obviously there is a humble hut and uh, a mother is engaged in uh, uh, making jasmine flowers and there's a boy and there's a girl standing. There's a raining kind of a context, right? So here, what is interesting about this painting and what is the what is the element that brings cast to the center of the uh, the fabric of this canvas is that that all those figures do not have a face if you look at it, right? So in a way, if you want to think about caste oppression, uh, you have to, it's not simply an economic oppression, it is also an oppression that, that doesn't recognize people, that doesn't uh, uh, give the due recognition to uh, the self and uh, persona of these people, right? It, it's the kind of, is a kind of intersecting of both economic and the non-economic kind of a forces. That's what is uh, the painting is actually hinting at. That if you want to think about the oppression of caste, is not simply uh, about not having a house or not having a you know not having a, a adequate dress. Or all that is true. That is there, but there is also not having a human uh, you know dignity and persona, right? So something is stolen from this group of people. So in a way, it brings cost to the uh, fabric of this particular uh, painting, right? So how much time is there? One more? Uh... Uh, one more minute. Just show one more. Show that we complete. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, let us complete. Yeah. You can move to the, that one. Uh, uh, this is in a way, it's a kind of a, uh, in the in the in the practices of caste, there is this idea of honor, right? So caste honor, it is also uh, centering itself within the honor of woman, right? Woman becomes the, uh, you know, that uh, 
people say this marapu sale or uh, pallu they say right so it's the people's uh, women's uh, uh, you know this women's body becomes a site of honor for caste you know to be protected and you know at any cost even with knives and uh, sickles that's the kind of uh, it kind of reference to that kind of a uh, context and then i maybe i'll uh, stop here basically to think about uh, if you are thinking about annihilation of caste uh, as a kind of larger uh, activity along with the politics there is also cultural politics of what can the artists and the arts do in a discursive realm uh, this is what they can do so they also you know they participate and they signify different meanings and they also engage with the history of art history of artistic products etc so i'll conclude here thank you uh, okay yes yeah, so i'll i'll have to think about that but uh, i mean even though this categories of tribes and castes did exist before that but i was also uh, pointing at the uh, i mean thing that you know it was reinforced uh, during the colonial period because you know there are many studies that suggest that even though the boundaries the hierarchies did exist before it it's, it was reinforced in the colonial period uh, so that's something that i have to look at yeah other thing that you suggested yeah yeah yes when you were showing these photographs you were also talking about the 1871 act uh, you know the tribal uh, communities act and many of these communities were branded as criminal communities crimin- criminal tribes and uh, it ha- that label held on for a very very long time in case of certain communities even now the pardi pardis for instance in maharashtra they will anything happens anywhere they will be held responsible and you know um, whatever the police treat them very atrociously but the point is uh, where are you trying to link up because somewhere you said that these are the communities which also wandered uh, or maybe i heard you wrong no you did say that you didn't say that but did it you know because their their freedom of movement was severely curtailed by that 1871 act and they had to go to the party law or you know whoever was the responsible person administrative in the village they had to go and they had to sort of give a roll call you know to show that they were there now did anything like that happen to these cup i'm talking about the pardis and the um, mangs in maharashtra which probably are the madigas here so uh, did it how did that act affect these communities is something that i would like to know um so here in uh, nizams hyderabad uh, it was the uh, erukalas yanadis even lambadas but uh, the whole concept of uh, criminal tribes is again i mean a group of people can be categorized it's not it's not a very clear i mean yes the communities were also uh, branded as tribe you know the criminal tribes but uh, again you can also say even if say i mean for example uh, lambadas were uh, uh, branded as the criminal tribes but uh, it's not a whole scale okay everywhere the lambadas were scattered throughout southern india so i don't it's not they were not uh, uh, they were not like captured or they were not say uh, it, it i don't think it it was implemented throughout the southern india so certain parts of southern india for uh, for example uh, i think in uh, hyderabad nizam hyderabad this was there but erukalas and yana these uh, other these tribes were uh, i mean you these are definitely uh, you know criminal tribes that's what that that was the idea that was there uh, i yes so i sort of forgot uh, the other thing that you added but no i was saying that these movement these these people were also mm. uh, prohibited from moving uh, yeah that was there another yes that is that's true yeah huh. so did it affect all of these tribes in the same way that they are in the movement uh, uh, no no that's uh, that is i from whatever i have just check because i yeah. think 
not uh, it was not uh, gonds or koyas or uh, these tribes were not uh, categorized they were not branded as criminal tribes whereas uh, erukulas lambadas they were branded as uh, criminal tribes so why does that happen um i need to look at that yeah, yeah. i suppose so because i i think criminality yeah. and that freedom of movement these are the two very major issues which affected the existence of these tribes to a great extent So maybe just yeah, yes, so yeah, I have a question for Patha Sarathi. I mean, it's uh, wonderful paintings. Um, they, I mean, they are wonderful paintings, and uh, I understand that they are by Dalit Dalit painters and so on. So uh, there is a great visibility as far as Dalit literature is concerned in the project of annihilation of caste and so on. But despite being a very prominent form, Dalit painters, when I think of um, you know Marathi Dalit uh, painters and so on. they have achieved a degree of visibility their paintings have achieved a degree of visibility but other painter other painters other paintings we have they have not come to the public um, public visibility and so on what is the reason and the, yeah and there is the first question and the second question is how did you come across these pain, painters and paintings and where are they now thank you see i think uh, today there are some uh, dalit uh, painters visible right you know for example you can talk think of uh, savi savarkar as a very important painter from maharashtra chandru from tamil nadu uh, but i what i understand is that many of these painters are uh, they very careful about uh, not to commercialize their painting so they are not so much into a uh, kind of quite comfortable with art galleries uh, some rich man coming and buying they they think about these objects as a political objects they don't want to uh get into the commercializing kind of uh, so that trend is there for example uh, people like chandurondal are very critical of uh, practices of art gallery and uh, commercial uh, kind of consumerism so you would say this is not something that is i producing for consumption of uh, you know somebody can come and buy with money right so he is quite uh, firm about it so that there are various other reasons other reason could be that uh is actually it, it in a in a way it is actually the dalit literature and the subsequent uh consciousness that produced which actually resulted in emergence of painting that doesn't mean that those painters were never there they were all painting various kind of things but it is only in the uh, you know the the violence kind of context in tamil nadu Uh, which kind of creates a, a kind of condition for the emergence of dalit painting right the many of them were painting and giving in the uh, various volumes and all that but it is only in that context it is produced as a, a dalit painting so so what is the second question that the follow up question is uh, where are they and are yeah the many of them are having solo exhibition and uh, uh, collections of their own uh, yeah so this is particularly from a collection of paintings uh from that workshop dalit painters workshop in 2004 done in madurai it has more than 35 40 uh paintings i have just shown a few of them uh thanks to the entire panel i have a quick query for parvati uh you made a show the performance ogadiga performance i was just wondering what happens to the women because we could see uh, men performing uh, the mariamma uh, sort of a thing what happens to the women um so thank you for that question um so um i have already said that uh, this uh, gadiga performance will be supervised by this shaman who is also the chief priest of the community um so uh, this hymns of the gadiga are very much uh, mnemonic so you have to memorize it it's not written down anywhere um it's in the adiya language called ravula so the ravula language uh, doesn't have a script so you have to the chief priest has to memorize it and then um he will be assisted by a number of other you know uh, assistant priests um if i may uh so um 
this tradition of gadiga will be passed on from the memory of the chief priest to the to his assistants um and uh, why women are not there in the scene um the ideas say that because of this problem of uh, ritualistic pollution associated with menstruation and all so women are uh, not allowed to um adorn this uh, this attire of the priest so you don't have a chief priest as you have chief priest um and um the men uh, since the women can't perform uh, since they are um, not allowed to perform uh, it's the men who uh, you know clad themselves in the sari and they perform as goddess mariamma a quick comment um more than a question maybe but i'd like to know you know what you think so this is a question for uh, parvati about mariamma so she's very much the goddess of uh borderless spaces and borderless you know communities so going across you know disregarding borders as you have said so between states uh, in fact in india but also between countries because i'm thinking of the cult of mayama in guyana or in the caribbean the cult of mayama in the caribbean mayama So uh so she's also you know very big in the Caribbean. So we also have to think of that kind of borders and Calapani you know crossing the dark waters. And so she's extremely present in the Caribbean in Guyana and she's also associated with that kind of emancipation as well and empowering uh you know so I think I mean we could also bring that dimension in and the yeah. diasporic you know yeah. dimension <laughs> sorry why do you know from the men just as the uh, you know the means of mm. mm. they say they say to the country to so basically also not to people do yeah. so probably some of these tribes also might have not there exactly exactly so, so this is this is the dias- yeah this is the, the construction of the diaspora in uh you know between 1834 and 1917 right so uh all those you know migration uh travels that that happened so i just wanted to bring that into the conversation as well so you know i just uh, wanted to ask uh, parvati like uh, in addition to uh this uh you know you have several tribes in uh, wynar so you are talking about the slave memory and we have also other tribal communities like the the kuruchia community the land owning communities etc so if you can mention a few things about uh, the general scene i guess uh, because uh, i mean the slave memory is probably not sh- a shared memory across several communities the tribal communities uh, itself in wynad so i guess uh, if you can mention whatever you have come across that would be great namaskar mandi నా పేరు డాక్టర్ సగిలి సుధార్ అని నేను తమిళనాడులో ఉన్న తెలుగు వాళ్ళ పైన పిహెచ్డీ చేశాను ఇందాక చెప్పారు రేణుక ఎల్లమ్మ మారియమ్మ అని మీరు చెప్తున్నారు తమిళనాడులో కూడా మారియమ్మ అనే పేరుతో ఉందనమాట అంటే పరశురాముడు తలని తీసినప్పుడు ఆమె తల తీసేసి వేరే తల పెట్టడం వల్ల మారియమ్మ అనే పేరు వచ్చిందని చెప్తారు అంటే ఒక్కొక్క ప్రాంతంలో మైగ్రేషన్ చేసినప్పుడు అలా వచ్చింది అనేసి మా గురుగారు సుబ్బాచార్ గారు కూడా చెప్పారు ట్రాన్స్లేషన్ ఎవరైనా చేసి ఫస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఆల్ ఐ వుడ్ రెస్పాండ్ టు వాట్ జూడిత్ మ్యామ్ వాజ్ సేయింగ్ సో దట్ ఇన్ఫర్మేషన్ వాజ్ రియలీ న్యూ టు మీ ఐ హ్యావ్ ఇన్ కమ్ అక్రాస్ దిస్ ఆస్పెక్ట్ ఆఫ్ గోడస్ మారియమ్మ ట్రావెలింగ్ టు ద క్యారిబియన్స్ ఓకే బట్ దెన్ ఐ హ్యావ్ ఓన్లీ హర్డ్ అబౌట్ హర్ జర్నీస్ ఫ్రమ్ యునో వయనాడ్ టు కర్ణాటక అండ్ ఎస్ అదర్ ఇస్ మారియమ్మ కల్ట్ ఇన్ తమిళనాడు ఎస్ వెల్ సో గోడస్ మారియమ్మ షీ ఈస్ సీన్ అస్ అన్ ఇన్కార్నేషన్ ఆఫ్ గోడస్ కాళి ఆర్ గోడస్ దుర్గా అండ్ షీ ఈస్ బిలీవ్ టు దిస్ బిలీవ్ టు బీ దిస్ గోడస్ who uh treats uh, uh you know chicken pox this is like uh, small pox and chicken pox yeah so she comes to this place and carries away all the disease causing seeds from there and she goes away so that's the cult so that the process of vaccination also yes. you know because uh, she being, i mean she obviously such a you know like a goddess from of the tribal communities of a very different kind of life and 
philosophy and theology and whatever you have. But uh, calling her a manifestation of Durga Durga or Kadi, um, uh, and uh, so what I was trying to say is that um, this is the mainstream narrative that she is an incarnation of Kali or Durga but then for the um, tribal people, for the Adiyas, um, she is uh, a goddess who brings, uh, brings prosperity to the agriculture. So that is their narrative on goddess Mariamma. Um, and then uh, uh, um, about the other tribes. So it's not just the um, Adia communities uh, who have a history of slavery in Vainad. For instance, there is this other community called Paniyas in Vainad. So um, if you uh, look at the history of these two communities, both of these communities were uh, tagged as slaves. Uh, they were engaged in this local uh, practice of bondage called Vallipani or Valli labor. So that's the vernacular term for uh, predial slavery or agricultural slavery in Malabar. So both of these communities were engaged in Vallipani or Valli labor. Um, so um, I haven't come across any other tribal communities, Adivasi communities who were categorized as Valli laborers. Um, um, and um, this colonial archives uh, very much talks about these two communities as Valley laborers. So the Kurichias and uh, for instance there are other communities like Chola Naikas, all of these communities um, um, relatively they had some uh, independence. For instance there are other, there is one community called Chola Naikas, they um, out and out they live in the forest, uh, they were not in touch with the landlords. Uh, so they, their history is different. Uh, they don't have much connection with this landlord and then settled agriculture and all. Uh, yeah, so uh, every other tribe has a different cultural history. No, in fact, that is what Reju is asking. Reju is asking when you say that uh, the Adivasis are slaves, mm. you are including everybody. <laughs> so there are others who are not. That's the point that I was making. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, Kuruchas are uh, known to be a very. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, they practice untouchability with the other tribes. Yes, exactly, huh. exactly. Hmm. I think so. I thank uh, the three panelists. I thank all of you for your patience. And also I thank the network, Judith, Nicole, and all others, Trimal Rangaru, and other Telugu newspaper friends. Thank you very much. Thank you.